virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity and now virgin most powerful radio is pleased to present hands-on apologetics with renowned catholic author and apologist gary machuda And welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. Yes, transmitting directly from the Midwest Command Center here in Southeast Michigan. It's great to be with you today. Got a great program in store. You know, and apologetics uh, Apologetics is basically explaining, defending the faith, using uh, history, scripture, reason, to remove intellectual obstacles that uh, prevent evangelism. Apologetics also has to do with uh, bringing people back into the faith that have left the faith. You know, there are many times people have been misled by bad information, poor thinking, uh, no popery history, all sorts of stuff. So as apologists, it's not merely just uh, clearing the road for evangelism for the unevangelized, but also bringing back lost sheep. And uh, all, a part of that also includes helping people who have left love you know loved ones who have left the church and that's what today's show is going to be all about it's good. many of you and um, many of us I should say have had loved ones who left the Catholic faith and what can we do about it you know what is our game plan how can we help them come back into the fold well our guest today is Maggie Green Maggie Green wrote a great book uh, put out by Sophia Institute Press it's called the St. Monica Club. And uh, this book explores not just what to say or what to, you know, how how to invite them back, but really how to wait, hope, and pray for your fallen away loved ones. Because in apologetics, it, it's not all arguments, folks. It's not all debates. It's not trying to uh, <laughs> win arguments like uh, Carl Keating was on the show the other day and that was a point that I've hammered over the years is you could win an argument and drive somebody further from Christ uh, the name of the game is really to uh, you know it's it's not just arguments it's also we're battling against um, you know we're battling against uh, more than just the material world let's put it that way and so we need a, a regimen of grace, a regimen of prayer. And what do we do when our loved one falls away? What can we do? Well, Maggie Green's going to be coming on the other side of the break. And we're going to talk about the St. Monica's Club and, uh, you know, this kind of regimen of prayer and uh, just preparing ourselves, cooperating with the Lord, uh, begging for the graces uh, to bring back our loved ones. So if you, uh, admit, perhaps you've lost some loved ones who left the faith, or perhaps uh, you know somebody, you can tell them about this broadcast, and uh, there's going to be lots of good information coming at you. On the other side of the break, in fact, your uh, calls are welcome at 888-526-2151. 888-526-2151. Maggie, I'm sure if you have any questions for her, uh, she will have a wealth of information that she can give you. Also, you can email your questions. So questions at handsonapologetics.com, and that is my uh, my official uh, dojo mailbox for all of you who have uh, maybe encountered things have lots of questions actually i've been getting a lot of scripture questions lately and the dojo mailbox is questions at hands on apologetics.com pretty easy to remember questions at hands on apologetics.com and uh yeah so uh, uh great program i'm looking forward to chatting with maggie on the other side of the break. Also, we do our critical exercises, critical thinking exercises, our fighting in the fallacy for today is an extremely important fallacy that occurs probably more than any other fallacy that I've encountered in apologetics in all the years I've been doing this, and that is the fallacy of quoting out of context. Uh, so uh, very, very important fallacy. You're going to find it over and over again, and I'll give you some apologetics hacks on how to uh, discover whether somebody's quoting something out of context. Also, we are going to meet the early church father. Since this is the last day of the year, uh, I thought, why not end with a bang? We'll end with the origin of Alexandria, one of the most interesting early church fathers, in my humble opinion. 
And yesterday we went through the biographical information about Origen. Today we're going to talk about his writings, uh, some of his books, some of his thoughts, and have a few great quotes from uh, this great early church father. So um, I want to welcome everybody listening. And, uh, you know, it's my time to give my shout-out to all the peeps out there <laughs> watching and listening on social media, on YouTube and Facebook. Hello, everybody. Welcome aboard. And I also want to welcome all of you listening via Catholic radio stations around the United States and also around the world through podcasts. By the way, folks, you know, podcast is uh, available 24-7. You can share it with people. Where do you get it? Well, you get it at Virgil Most Powerful's Apologetics, or oh, not Apologetics, uh, flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org, all one word. Just go to our shows, and you can uh, share shows that you enjoyed with your uh, friends. You can listen to them again. Perhaps you're going to miss part of the program. Go to our shows, click on Hands on Apologetics or any of the other awesome shows that uh, Virgin Most Powerful produces like Jesus 911, Terry and Jesse. All of them are up there. Uh, avail yourself of them because, uh, you know, uh, information is so important. And many times it's hard to talk to somebody face to face. They just won't listen to you. They won't grant arguments. But if you say, hey, listen to the show. It was really interesting. Uh, sometimes they'll listen to a podcast, so you can always send them a link or do whatever you do on social media. Uh, all right. Well, Michelle, hey, thank you, and Happy New Year to you as well. And also, uh, Jose, thank you so much. And anyone else who said that on the chat room. Uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, online section of the dojo. Uh, you're a part, part, part of the show, so uh, I wish all of you a, a blessed New Year. And uh, let's jump into our Finding the Fallacy, shall we? The Finding the Fallacy is quoting out of context. And you can guess basically how this fallacy works. It takes a line out of context. It doesn't get more simple than that. It's, uh, this is something I run into constantly. In fact, I had a question today on Scripture, and lo and behold, it was a quote out of context. What is, you can make Scripture or any other source, historical source, uh, literature, whatever, you can make it say or th make it appear to be saying pretty much anything if you just pull a line or two out of it, devoid of its context. So a text outside of its context can be a pretext. So you don't want to do that. Whenever somebody cites scripture, here's my apologetics hack. This is something I always do. Because um, sometimes on the, on the radio, somebody will call up and, and quote a line and say, see this line? Uh, contradicts some sort of Catholic doctrine. I always go back, and what you need to do is read a couple of verses earlier and a couple of verses later, okay, and see whether that quote, as it's being used, really does fit the original context. And it will jump right out at you whether or not it's being used correctly. So, you know, you, you need to do that. You need to check the context, read a few verses earlier, a few verses later, and uh, what you find out is... Now, you almost always find the answer to whatever problem is being uh, given. For example, today I got an email where a, a fellow says in Deuteronomy, in the, I think it's 5, 8, 5, 7, uh, God says that you know those who uh, worship idols, that he will vent his wrath on the fifth and sixth generation. They said, we'll see, how can a just God uh, vent his wrath on people who didn't commit a sin, you know? But what they missed is if you read the next couple of verses, you find out that God says, and I will bless the faithful ones to the thousandth generation. So it's, why is God unjust for punishing people for the fourth or fifth and not unjust for rewarding somebody for something they didn't do, right? And uh, so that kind of uh, just reading the context kind of unraveled the whole objection. So, um, yes, so... Uh, Reading it in context, that's that's really the hack. Um, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And more times than not, folks, if you read it in context, you will also get the answer to the objection. Um, it's uncanny how many times that happens. So that is quoting out of context. Uh, let's go to the Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is origin of Alexandria. Last episode, uh, we talked all about his biographical information. Let's talk a little bit about his writings. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of his most important writings is known as the Fundamental Doctrines, or periarchon in Greek, or First Principles. Sometimes it's translated. 
Uh, this is his first attempt at a manual of dogmatic theology, and it's generally referred to as De Principalis, um, which is translated uh, Fundamental Doctrines. The book consists of four books, and it was written sometime around the year 220-230 AD, originally in Greek, although only a few fragments have survived in Greek. Uh, it's in extent in its entirety through uh, a free Latin translation by Rufinus, or another early church father, uh, who almost certainly attempted to kind of expurgate or uh, kind of smooth over some of the, the more heretical speculations that Origen had. And then there's another early church father, Jerome, who was very much against, he was w- one time a big fan of Origen, turned out to be a big opponent of Origen because of those uh, his speculations. Uh, he made an incredibly literal translation that's probably just as biased against Origen as Rufinus's translations for Origen. Uh, but Jerome's translation didn't survive the ages. All we have is Rufinus. So we do have the whole book uh, in a Latin translation, and it's got lots of great material. It's a little hard. If you ever sit down and try to read this book, most of the early church father books, except for, I think, Clement of Alexandria, you can pretty much pick up and read. I don't think you need a lot of theology or philosophy. Uh, that's not true for first principles, though. Um, it, it has lots of good theology, but it also kind of gets into the weeds in terms of platonic uh, f- philosophical thought. So what are some good nuggets in there? Well, uh, let me give you one quote from this book. It's, Origen wrote, quote, Although there are many who believe that they themselves hold to the teachings of Christ, there are yet some among them who think differently from their predecessors. The teaching of the church has indeed been handed on through an order of succession from the apostles and remains in the churches even to the present time. That alone is to be believed as truth, which is in no way at variance with the ecclesiastical and apostolic tradition. And that is Origen, our early church father for today. Coming up on the other side of the break, we have Max Green. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we come to understand. According to St. Augustine, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. May God grant us a strong living faith in Him and His divine plan of salvation and help us to believe so that we may understand. or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org 877-LIFE-US1 Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
and welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics, and you know this is a heavy topic to close the year. But you know, here at Hands on Apologetics, we don't shy away from heavy topics because it's it's actually a topic that's been near and dear to my heart for a number of years. And uh, we're talking about how to you know what what do you do when your loved one leaves the church? Uh, what course of action do you have? Uh, many times you, you can't even speak to them, let alone. Uh, uh, explain the faith or do apologetics well to help us uh, kind of get on board as far as a regiment to uh, work on ourselves and also bring them back through prayer and sacrifice is our guest Maggie Green. Maggie Green is the pen name of a Catholic wife and mother who waits for uh, some of her children to return to the faith. She and her husband live with their children in the mid Atlantic area in the United States. And Maggie Green, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Thank you for having me, Gary. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for writing this book, because it's a book that I think really needed to be written. (laughs) Because there's nothing out there, really, as far as... uh, Yeah, go ahead. That was what prompted the book, was my own searching for something to give me a guideline when I entered into this landscape as i mentioned no one anyone who wakes up and finds themselves a member wishes they weren't yeah and um there's not a lot of resources out there um for how to respond in a loving evangelizing way that doesn't push away the person you're hoping to woo back yes yeah absolutely yeah, um, and at my parish, for example, um, I tried to start a St. Monica group where uh mm. we invite parishioners who had loved ones leave that we'd get together for prayer. Uh, I could help answer any objections that maybe their loved ones, you know, and we could pool resources. And it, quite frankly, it failed because I didn't realize that there is uh, there's a kind of stigma. You know, they, they didn't they were afraid that if people i heard were afraid to come to the group because they thought their neighbors might be there and somehow feel like they've failed as parents yeah there is a real sense of guilt like you like you you failed at your fundamental obligation when you baptize your children you promise to raise them in the faith and if you go about this faithfully there's a um presumption and it's incorrect that um that will somehow keep all of your, your ducks in a row. And I, I put it this way, God created Eden, and his ducks went astray. Yeah. So we're much less capable of Eden than God, and so we have That's to true. a lot for that pesky, vexing free will that we have. But it leaves us in a landscape of not knowing what to do or how to build a community, and that's, I think, part of the devil's design is to make you feel isolated and ashamed and afraid to really talk about what hurts, yeah. and that makes it hurt more. So um, I know that some people have tried to start up um, St. Monica clubs with the proposal being simply to go to Mass, um, to maybe look at the book and like maybe read a bit of it, um, and then discuss it over dinner, but talk about everything else in life as well. So that it's not solely focused on so much mourning your loss but on building community which helps strengthen you for weathering the storm yeah yeah absolutely because it isn't a case of you know doing the steps to get them back it's a case of loving them through their journey of wrestling with god yes yeah absolutely um yeah that was the impression i received too uh uh you know you feel alienated you feel like you're alone that you failed somehow even though god basically told you to be faithful and you know there is that free will people can take gifts and throw them away and and also the feeling of well, where do i do you know what's what steps should i take now uh was this actually a group that you started for the book or uh how did the book come about uh, the book came about from my own um searching for answers like you said there, there's not much yeah. out there and so i started scratching around and i i i coined the phrase for myself that I was a member of the St. Monica's Club because I was <laughs> wanting um, people to come home. 
Yeah. Um, and I felt it keenly at the mass, you know, the empty spot in the pew. And I understood intellectually. I understood what the objections were. Um, but ultimately, you, you can't force a person to love. Right. And that includes loving God. Um, what you can do is be a witness to them of God's love. That's your whole job from this point forward. And it is harder because they're not seeing the source of your joy. But that means you've been called to a special mission to pray and witness to the world, and to, in particular to your prodigal, be it your spouse, your brother, your child, your friend. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be a joyful witness to them and to love them with everything that you got. And know that you're getting to experience a bit of Christ's agony in the garden. You're getting to be like Mary and have your heart be pierced. Yeah. You're getting to be like God the Father because he gives all good things and still they harden their hearts. But you also are getting to be like, you know, the, the, the trust that in God's time, grace will pierce their hearts. And your job in the meantime is to pray without ceasing. Yes. Yeah, very good. And, uh, and you know, the charism, it's funny, St. Monica of all the saints, of course, you know, she's, she's kind of the patron saint of uh, those who have loved ones lost, you know. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about St. Monica and her background. Yeah, for those who don't know, St. Monica is the mother of St. Augustine, doctor of the church. But he wasn't always a doctor of the church. He was a son who got enamored with the world. He had a mistress. Um, he was very popular, very charismatic, um, very highly regarded in the intellectual elites of his day. Um, and she persisted in praying for him. She persisted in having other people pray for him. She got people she thought he would respect and listen to to talk to him. She asked other people to talk to him. She persisted for 17 years. But the key component in that is not that she was harassing her son, but that she was advocating to her son and for her son. But the relationship was very clearly congenial that whole 17 years, even though sometimes he didn't necessarily appreciate her attentions. Like one time he told her, We're really, I'm leaving at, um, at this time. We're leaving at this, at this time of the day. And he left the day before so that she couldn't follow him. But she got on the next boat. You know, yeah. so yeah. he said he tried to ghost his own mother. Um, so, <laughs> you know, so, but eventually after those 17 years of prayer and persistence and petitioning, he came into the, came into the church fully and with a bang, late have I loved thee. You know, we know him through the confession. We know only of her through confessions, through his descriptions of her, his stories of her. But he tells that she had a dream in which she saw him with her. And when she told him that, vision, he said, well, you could if you let go of all this space nonsense, if you just stopped. She said, well, no, the vision wasn't of you, me being with you, it was of you being with me. Mm -hmm. So that's an encouragement to us to persist and to trust that God yeah. hears our prayers. Just yeah. God's time, not ours. Exactly. Yeah, one, th one uh, aspect of her life that I think is really helpful for those who have people leave their faith is... Uh, you know, St. Augustine wouldn't be St. Augustine had he not left. If he remained faithful, he may have been a good Catholic, good Christian. But in God's providence, you know, uh, he's kind of the prodigal son. And the, it would took him, you know, the incredible intellect he had, you know, dealing with heresies and stuff and eventually coming back, that when he came back, he was uh, ripped and roaring to, you know, be a doctor of the church. And, uh, he you know, was on fire. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I mean, that's the one thing I take from St. Monica's, you know, it's a heartbreak to have lost someone lo lose their faith. Uh, but, you know, there's always trust in God's providence that he has a plan. And ultimately, you know, a good's going to come out of this terrible evil. Yeah, and it's just to really trust that God has more vested interest than we do. Yes. As much as we want it. But it also may be that having our child go away will force us to really make sure that we are not wanting our child to have a faith life as a credit to us. Yes, that's Which true. is a very, I think, strong temptation, particularly 
for you know parents. You know, it's kind of you know it's kind of a badge in a sense, and it can be it can be a form of an ego extension. So it really makes you deepen your faith and recognize that your faith is dependent upon your relationship with God, and their faith is is dependent upon their willingness to agree with to have a relationship with God. And your main job is to be like the saints to intercede for your child. That's your job. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very good. And, you know, it's tough. Uh, you touched on earlier um, something I didn't really consider, but you're right. Um, it's hard to be uh, showing the love of Christ and, you know, uh, the joy of salvation for your loved one that left because it's also such, you're going through such an enormous pain as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and so there, you know, you have to really look to the church's teaching on redemptive suffering and that you are sacrificing your offering. You know, Mary kept all these things in her heart. Mm-hmm. And um, so that that's where you get to put this. You get to put this in your heart, bring it to the Eucharist when you go to Mass or to adoration, bring it to your rosary, put it in all of, all of your little sufferings. That's what you get to do. You get to do the little things with great love, and that's where you put all that pain. Yeah, yeah, and that's and easier said not, than done. Simply, <laughs> oh yeah, it's all. Everything is easier said than done. I mean, really, <laughs> there's nothing that's easier to do than to say. <laughs> yes, that's true. You know? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it's the living part of you know loving loving your neighbor sounds beautiful until you have to do it. Doing little things with great love sounds poetic until you have to you know go do the dishes that they left in the sink. That's true. (laughs) That's true. You just got you got to just get it done, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, um, kind of battle through all the the heartbreak. Yeah, and and that that really was what I wrote this book was to help other people who might be out there who are experiencing this grief. And it is, uh, you know, you go through all the stages of grief. Yeah, but. um, you also have to trust that, as I said, God has a plan, and it's bigger than any plan I have. Yes, absolutely. And it's better than any plan that I have. Yeah. Um, St. Monica learned that, and we can learn it too. Yeah, very good. Yeah, we're, we're chatting with uh, Maggie Green, and on the other side of the break, Maggie, uh, your book has some great points and tips and uh, you know suggestions. So I'd like to maybe go through through these uh you know, sections that you have and talk a little bit about, oh. you know, things that people can do. Absolutely. All right. Great. Absolutely. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics, ladies and gentlemen, and we're talking with Maggie Green. The book is The St. Monica Club, How to Wait, Hope, and Pray for Your Loved One uh, through Sophia Institute Press. More to come after this break. Stay tuned. We have an exciting story for you to listen to. The story of John Pridmore. John Pridmore was a hitman for the gangs in East London. I met some guys who seemed to have everything that I thought would make you happy. So I started working for these people. So to my shame, I was involved in vicious crime of all sorts. He collected debts for the gangs. And if people didn't pay their debts, it was his job to kill them. And as I drove home that night, I thought, what have I become? That I could kill someone and not even care. He was in the elevator on his way up to the 17th floor, and there was a 17-year-old young man in the elevator with him. Suddenly, this young man looked John right in the eye, and he said, Jesus loves you. And I said the first prayer I'd ever said. I said, up to now, all I've done is take from you, God. Now I want to give. Within a year, by the grace of God, John was able to get out of the gang and be freed from this road to hell that he had been walking on. Go to Virgin Most Powerful YouTube channel and listen to this story today. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, A portion of it will go right back in supporting 
Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Maggie Green, the author of the book, uh, St. Monica Club, How to Wait, Hope, and Pray for Your Lost Loved Ones. And Maggie, um, you know, I love your book. It's very short sections. Uh, You know, I almost don't want to call it chapters, but uh, all of it's lots of great wisdom and direction for those who are undergoing this ordeal of having their loved one left. And the, one of the first things you bring up is that there are no quick fix, fixes. Yes. Um, well, that's because I, I admit I tried them all. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, you know, I went through rosaries like a chain smoker. I really did. Um, you know, I, I made bargains with God. I made deals. Please, you know, I'm going to give up this and you're going to fix that. Uh, which, you know, ask and you shall receive. I'm like quoting to Jesus and quoting to God. Here you go. I'm in adoration. I'm telling you, ask and you receive. I'm asking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it wasn't, it, it was demanding of God as opposed to asking because I really wasn't up op, open to the option of wait. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or not now. So when I say there are no quick fixes, it's because the person who walks away from God didn't get to this point overnight. Yes. It's been a gradual erosion of their relationship. Either, you know, something's been broken in their relationship with God or with other people, or both. And as we all know, relationships take time, take effort, and require an act of the will to mend. So, yeah, you can pray for an immediate infusion in grace, and I absolutely recommend that. But what you don't get to do is say, Okay, God, today, now. Although I still do. Uh, you know, <laughs> how about now? Um, yeah. Now would be nice. Um, but it's God's time. Thy will be done is a very hard prayer to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, indeed. In fact, that's yeah, that comes right out of Augustine, you know, where you pray, Lord, give me patience, and I need it now, you know, or yeah. <laughs> or yeah. give me something, exactly. but not yet, you know. Uh, yeah, yes, Exactly. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, they, they've they already gone through a long process, which probably has more than one influence that has eroded that uh, re- that relationship with God. And, and that takes a lot of time to amend. Yeah, you're right. And the other thing is that people tend to think, okay, well, if I just figure out the right argument, and then you're treating somebody's faith journey like a legal brief, like here's yeah. bullet point one, objection. Here's bullet point two, objection. <laughs> I yep. don't know of anybody who ever has had a conversion because of argument. Um, maybe there is somebody, but I don't know someone who said, by golly, thank you for reasoning me out of that. Um, mm-hmm. It's a conversion of the heart. Yeah, even in you those cases, yeah, even in those cases, it's usually uh, after they've argued with, you know, dozens of people over years, you know, and then finally there's an intellectual conversion. So even that's not a quick right. fix. It's, yeah, so it's not a case, you know, when I say there's no quick fix, it's not like, okay, if I just go bone up on the right character, I'm going to go, oh, you're right. Um, yeah. It's, more, it's that you have to work on your relationship with that person, loving that person. And that's how you're going to witness to them God's love. And that's really what you, again, I go back to it, that's your whole job, yeah. to love this person, both by prayer and by action, by word and by deed, by what you say and what you don't say. And, you know, yes, you weep. And I go to adoration, and I howl like God. But mm. God's got big shoulders. He can take it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, boy, all these sections, I, I wish we could cover all of them because uh, all of them are gold. Uh, an, an important one right after that is sitting at the feet of Jesus is doing something. Well, because we tend to think of prayer as almost a passive activity or a last resort mm-hmm. or something which is sort of a gesture as opposed to an actual willful act of the heart, the mind, and soul. And, and, and we have to understand that that is the better portion. That is what we are called to do. You know, if you go to adoration, you're not just sitting. You are interacting. You are adoring. You are worshiping. You are petitioning. And hopefully, you're also listening. Mm -hmm. If you sit at the feet of Jesus and listen, God will speak to you, but Jesus will speak to you about how to love this child, how to love this person. And it's the way that he loves us. And... That's really what we're talking about. And you can't, I don't, I don't want people to underestimate the reality of prayer being a very active, most active thing you can do for someone else. Yeah, very powerful, very powerful. If you think about it, it's really, uh, you know, Jesus is saying, hey, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me, <laughs> you know. Right, right. And if they rejected you, they first rejected me. Yeah. Also, I mean, yes, and that—that that is what you're. So, what you're there to do is to pray for them, and you know, your job is to go so close to God that they stop seeing you and they see God. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, boy, it's great points. Um, do something loving. That's a great action point. Uh, kind of flush it out up for us. Well, you know, we have the, the eight spiritual and eight corporeal acts of mercy, but I mean actually particularly marry it to the person that you are engaged with, that you are aching for. Do something loving that they will be able to see as loving, not as a manipulation, but as an affirmative act that is a self-giving to them. Mm-hmm. It can be a gift of time. It can be a gift of service. It can be a gift of words. It can be a gift of super silence. It can be touch. I mean, use all the languages of love. But do something that shows your actual genuine love for this person. When this person was a baby, if you're the parent, you loved them before they ever did anything. And you could have stared at them forever. And they didn't have to do squat, and you thought, they're the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Um, remember that feeling when you look at this person. And that's how you should try to seriously interact with them, is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to them. <clears throat> how it's fleshed out is based on who you're interacting with. Mm-hmm. If they love music, then go listen to their music. If they love art, then go and look at their art. And try to go as if you were representing Jesus, to look at what they're offering and find whatever is beautiful in it and respond to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people ruin it when they try to do something loving in a manipulative way, kind of like, you know, here's uh, here's a, a gift that you really needed over the years. And by the way, here's also a copy of the catechism. You know, and yeah. people, well, it's kind people of like can sense. God. Yes. Yeah. People can sense this kind of manipulative, uh, you know, uh, spin. And I, I think just sheer love, like you said, you know. Looking at them with the love of Christ, with the love you had back when they were infants, um, that's very profound. Yeah, I mean, you can't bribe someone into love. You can't manipulate someone into love. You cannot argue someone into love. You can only love someone into love. And that's really it's that simple. And that hard. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you a question. Uh, when uh, loved ones leave the faith, it, it does that necessarily mean there's a rupture between your relationship with them, like the parents' relationship to the children? Uh, does, does that always go in hand, or can someone leave the faith and their their relationship remains pretty much untouched? Um, I don't know how to answer that because I don't know everybody's relationship with their parents or with their children. Yeah. Um, I can say that you do everything in your power to love them as you always have and perhaps even more um and 
you just keep working at it. You, you, you have to work harder at the relationship because you don't have as many shared points of reference. Right. Um, but you just keep issuing the invitations. That, that's, your, that's what you keep doing. You keep looking for little venues, little places where you can share experience. Um, can it change a relationship? Absolutely. But what it can't change or shouldn't change or you shouldn't let change is your love for them. If anything, you should just keep multiplying it in an attempt to um, woo them. As I say, we, we're jo- our job is to woo them, not to win them. Right. God's going, Christ is going to do the winning. We're just supposed to, you know, set the table. Christ will serve the feast. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, how about be kind, not nice? Okay, yeah, that's one that... Um, <laughs> There's a tendency to try to not ever talk about anything that might upset the apple cart. And that's a false, again, that's having an inauthentic relationship where you don't actually talk to the other person about anything that might cause friction. And that's another form of manipulation where everything is fine, we're fine, we're good, we'll just talk about nothing that upsets anybody. Mm -hmm. And... That's as inauthentic as, say, here's an Xbox and here's a copy of the Catechism. <laughs> you know? It's just, right. It's just as false. It's just as false. But what you don't do is you don't sit there, you know, grandmother's here. Let's talk about your problems with the church. That's just wrong. Um, it's more like be kind, not nice. It's make sure that your responses to the other person are always authentic, are genuine from the heart. And when and, and trust the Holy Spirit's going to give you a little prickle of the heart of when to speak, and more importantly, when not to. Um, yeah, that's much harder. <laughs> yeah, um, the well-trained tongue is a constant prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that is the, you know that sometimes not saying something at the right time can be more important than saying something at the right time. You have to. We have to give people the luxury of quiet to hear God's still voice, and that's hard to hear if we're harping on them. That's true. That's true. But on the other hand, you also don't want to give the impression that you've backed away from your convictions and that everything is a okay too. So it, it is a very fine line to walk, isn't it? It is. But you know what you do is you just, as I said, keep issuing invitations. So you know I. Now, invite the person to come with you because you're going to Mass or you're going to go do something that might have a component in it that is religious, whatever it is. Just keep inviting them. Hey, we're going to go work at the soup kitchen to start the new year. Or, hey, we're, we're going to go see so-and-so who's getting confirmed. Do you want to come? Uh, you know, you keep inviting people to moments where they can experience a little bit of God's grace in action. Very good. We're talking about St. Monica's Club with Maggie Green. Stay tuned. More to come after this break. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. At Aramis at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies, featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Carstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14, 2020, at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today for Adoramus at the Triduum. Jesus said in Matthew 26, Stay awake and pray that you may not enter into temptation. According to St. Ephraim, Jesus, who feared nothing, experienced fear 
and asked to be freed from death, although he knew it was impossible. How much more must we persevere in prayer before temptation assails us, so that we may be freed when the test has come? May God grant that we may withstand temptation and carry out His will in all things. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. And we are talking about what to do when loved ones leave the church. Well, join the St. Monica Club. That's the name of the book put out by Sophia Institute Press. And we were talking to the author, Maggie Green. And, uh, Maggie, why don't we... Um, Let's switch gears because your book, I mean, there's lots of great practical tip. Like I said, I, I wish we could go through like every section because each one is just gold. Um, but let's talk about uh, preparing spiritually. You know, the what can we do spiritually uh, when our loved one leaves the faith? Uh, for example, um, the rosary is is your best tool. Let's talk about the rosary. Okay, um, well, I love the rosary. It has, uh, when you have a child that's far from the faith, you're particularly connected to the Blessed Mother because you know how the world rejected her son and that her own heart was pierced and how she responded to the treatment of her son is an example, again, of how we are to react as well. As you said very insightfully, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting him. And so we have to really spiritually prepare ourselves to be able to, in a sense, we adopt our own children or our own loved ones, whoever they are, into our hearts. And, I, you know, take the rosary and on the, on the um, dedicate um, a particular decade to that loved one and say it with them in mind or say the whole rosary. You know, I have decades for each of my children that I focus on. Um, but the one that comes to mind most commonly is um, the finding of Jesus in the temple, because that's what I want. I want them to find Jesus in the temple. And right. so it's a way of looking at the, the, that is that is what you do, and the rosary will spiritually prepare you for whatever, in addition to the graces that it promises when you say it. And if you say it as a couple, father and the mother, um, it will steal you for whatever comes to the head. Yeah, very good. So you have the consolation of the rosary. You have the intercession, the power of intercession. And uh, also, you know, uh, yeah. coming alongside Mary as well. Yeah, I, I, I have no qualms about asking every person in heaven who I can think of and just throwing them, here, help this, <laughs> help me with this, help me with this. Yeah. I'm saying, Anthony, help them find the Christ child. Um, you know, St. Patrick, let Christ be before them, let Christ be behind them, um, you know, using all those prayers with a particular intention in mind um, so that you really are asking those saints to intercede with you. And um, I use their confirmation saints. I use um, their namesake saints, hmm. ones that I feel have a special connection to the particular situation. Um, I pray for other people whose children have a similar issue. And so you look for saints who match up, would really understand. Yeah, boy, what great advice. I, I wouldn't have thought confirmation saint, but you're absolutely right. Uh, boy, what a great connection there. That's what I mean. This this book has lots of really good practical advice. Um, and also you have sacraments and sacramentals. Uh, yes, well, I mean, look, you cannot be an effective witness of Christ if you are 
struggling with your yeah, if your own spiritual house is not in order. Yeah. And that takes constant maintenance, to say the very least, at least not for me. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And so <clears throat> frequent um, availing of confession, of the Eucharist, of Mass, um, of the Rosary, of devotions, um, kind of steeping yourself in the faith is what I would say, um, through maybe listening to your daily podcast of the readings, or to um, talks which uh, teach you the catechism. It's kind of mentally honing your heart so that you can be more receptive to God's graces and more responsive to the opportunities that the Holy Spirit will present to you. Yeah. And yes. But you need to do that homework, in a sense. Yeah, yeah very ready. good. Yeah, you can't be open to, you know, the promptings of God's grace if you're not in the state of grace, right? Yeah, you, you will clout your, you, you will not be able to respond as effectively if you are yourself compromised. Yeah. It's just that straightforward. Yeah, very good. So the, the use of sacramentals, that would just be part of your normal devotion, or do you have anything special that you uh, use sacramentals with? Um, well... I think it really is very much a personal connection that you have with um, whatever sacramentals have for them for your own lives developed an affinity for. So w w one of the things that I, I see people do is like turn away from what they've always done that means something to them because they don't want to offend. That's part of the be kind, not nice. Yeah. Um, so you have to still be honest about what you love. So if you have a devotion to the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and you have it say on every day at 3 o'clock, don't turn it off. Right. You know, don't hide that you listen you know, listen to the Mass when you're getting ready for work, or don't hide the fact that you do these things. You have a statue of the Blessed Mother, a statue of Joseph, um, or the Holy Family, or you have a, a, a holy water fountain in your house, or you have a rosary that you say, don't now, those should be; those are yours, and you don't get to you don't you don't discard those to protect the other person. You say them because you believe, and yeah. they will. You know, you're not doing it to let them see you praying, but you are doing it so they will know that you are praying. Yes, you've always done it. Great. If you haven't always done it, New Year's a great time to start. You know, get up 15 minutes earlier, say a rosary, hold the beads while you do it. And just sit there doing it in the quiet of your house for that person. They don't have to know it's for them, but you will. And it will change how you interact with that person. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, one reason I credit that I've stayed in the faith my whole life was because my mom's uh, prayer, her commitment to uh, praying, you know, she loved novenas. And uh, the witness of her praying, she didn't do it you know, to say, hey, look, this is, I'm holy, I'm praying or something. Uh, but, you know, we'd pass by her room and see her on their knees praying. And and that witness, like, showed me at the youngest age that, wow, the faith is really is real, you know, that there's this real relationship there. And so you're right. I mean, even if they don't see you praying, you never know. God can use uh, a rosary on a bed, you know, that they might pass by and see it and say, oh, mom's praying. That's, you know, that could be an opportunity of grace. Yes. And that's what you have to, and you don't know who else is witnessing. So yes. again, it's just your job is to do the do the work, and let God kind of steer people to see what they need to see. Yes, yeah, very good. You know, well, one that one section that intrigued me was uh, be brave even in little things. Well, that's like turning on the radio to listen to the Divine Mercy Chaplet if you have somebody in the car. Who is oh, okay. in perhaps vocal. You know, it's little things like that. Or, you know, <clears throat> that maybe you have younger children and you want to play the family rosary. You say it. You don't sit there. Yeah, that's part of, it's not in your face. We're saying the rosary because you don't believe. We're saying, we're <laughs> saying the rosary. Yeah. And, and just, you know, anyone who wants to join in the family rosary, come sit. Yeah. There you go. Very and good. Okay. They don't. They don't. Do you, um, 
let's see, we have a, a few minutes left. Do you have any particular uh, prayers or novenas that you found particularly helpful um, that you receive great consolation doing? Well, I honestly, I go to adoration, and I also, and my, my favorite moment was when I felt very estranged, and I was praying for adoration, and I, I at the Eucharist, and I um, could see that one person was very fixed in their position on one side, and the other was very fixed in the other, and I saw them essentially as the nail. I said, okay, God, I know you can move mountains, but I need you to move too. Mm. Um <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 that day there was a reconciliation. Wow. Um, and so to me, at, to, you cannot spend enough time in front of the Eucharist yes. in adoration. That to me is my favorite. That and the Rosary are my favorite um, forms of prayer. Um, I wish I could say I am 100% faithful in saying the Rosary. Um, I fall asleep saying the rosary sometimes. I fall asleep sometimes in adoration, and I consider myself in good company because the apostles fell asleep with Jesus. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but the reality is I go there, and I receive, every time I go, I know I am strengthened. I know that my heart is um, softened, and my willingness to enter into the sacraments is more fully developed. So that's what I would say. Yeah, well, it, you know, that I think could be mer more meritorious is uh, praying when it's hard to pray, you know, when you're sleepy and you mm -hmm. can't quite make it. I think that's a lot more meritorious than if you're over-caffeinated <laughs> and you just need to do something. Uh, I do so, that too, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the, the reality is, yes, no, if you can pray when you don't feel like it, especially, you know, you know, when, 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 you know, you're doing little things, but with great resistance, um, yeah. <laughs> um, right. then it feels like you're doing a huge thing because you're, and eventually going, that's why the rosary is so great because I may start off in really the wrong place for saying the rosary, but Mary will work with me and through me to get me to the right place. Um, she's both the undoer of not, and I call her the knitter of souls. <laughs> that's my, that's my personal title for her. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I ask her to please get my soul. <laughs> <It's not old. laughs> that's great. Well, Maggie, we're out of time. Uh, this was great. I, I'll have to have you back on the program. We could talk some more about the book. I'd love it. That would be wonderful. Excellent. And uh, I hope it brings I hope it brings some peace and some solace to people out there who are hurting. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for writing the book, and thank you for coming on the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, that's Maggie Green, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. And the book is St. Monica Club, How to Wait, Hope, and Pray for Your Fallen Love. Fall Away Loved Ones, uh, it's a great book. It's put out by Sophia Institute Press. You can get it at Sophia Institute Press website, or you can pick it up at Amazon.com. I highly recommend this. You know, I know many people who are listening to the program have had loved ones who have fallen away from the faith, and... Uh, you could feel isolated and alone. You could feel, uh, what do I do? Where do I go? You know, how should I pray? Uh, this book has lots of very good tips. And uh, I, I, reading through it, I found lots of good, helpful, practical material. So check it out, St. Monica's Club. Uh, pick it up. It's a great book to have. And, you know, this is the fastest hour on Catholic Talk Radio. <laughs> We're already done. On the other side... Uh, Terry and Jesse show coming up. High Impact Catholic Talk coming at you. And it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center here and turn off the dojo lights. It's been a pleasure being with you on this last day of 2019. I pray that everybody has a wonderful and blessed New Year. And God willing, we'll talk again soon. All right. Bye bye, everybody. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat and that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, 
you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.